And I want to welcome everyone uh, that this is the last day of our No Spank Challenge, which has been an online event that was sponsored by Parenting Beyond Punishment. And this event was intended to support parents who have made a commitment to stop yelling and spanking and using other punitive methods of parenting their children. And I want to especially thank you, Dr. Alfie Cohn, for coming on today to talk about uh, your great book. It's called The Myth of the Spoiled Child. Uh, if you're not familiar with Dr. Cohn's work, uh, he's published many books and, and quite a few articles. My favorite is the Unconditional Parenting book. It encourages parents to really abandon the idea of controlling children through a kind of reward and punishment model and to support their intrinsic motivation as, as uh, children to do well, to be connected to us, and to live a happy creative life. And in particular, I want to thank you, Dr. Cohn, for recognizing and speaking out against our society's pervasive uh, disrespectful attitudes towards children, which I think makes parenting that much harder. So. I thought your book was, uh, in, in one sense, it's wonderful because it uses science to help us get a perspective on our cultural values that are not supportive of children. And this idea of a spoiled child is a really interesting one. And I just wanted you to maybe start with helping us understand what is a spoiled child and what is permissiveness? Well, most people by spoiling, if they're not talking about giving kids too much stuff, which is not the sense in which I'm interested in it here, are talking about the idea that children um, have too much to say about their own lives, that they have more power than adults think they should have. Um, and it's often believed that when parents don't discipline in very traditional ways, that children will become spoiled, that they will have a sense of entitlement, uh, that they will feel too good about themselves, um, and that they will do bad things, because at the core of these beliefs is the notion that children uh, without firm control and regulation uh, will swing from the lights and eat ice cream all day and never go to sleep and be nasty toward everyone. So a really dark view of children, and by extension of human nature, underlies the very conservative beliefs about kids that, as I try to explore in the book, turn out not to be very well founded. Yeah, that's really, so can you help uh, help our, our audience understand where this belief even comes from? What are, what's motivating this idea or this attitudes towards children? Well, it's attitudes about children and about people more generally that tend to lead towards specific assumptions and behaviors on the part of parents and others in our society. But it's not easy to trace back where those beliefs themselves come from. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think there are differences from one century to another to some extent and from one culture to another. But I don't think that the United States in the 21st century is particularly child-friendly, let alone child-centered. And one of the key pieces of evidence for that is how often we're accused of spoiling or being too permissive toward our children and being child-centered and hearkening back to the good old days when kids knew their place when they did as told without any back talk, when parents set firm limits and held kids accountable, which is a euphemism for making them suffer uh, when they strayed from the straight and narrow. I mean, first of all, uh, that's probably not true because in the first chapter of the book, I go back a generation at a time showing that people back then in the good old days were offering exactly the same kinds of complaints and hearkening back still further to when <laughs> yes. things were good. But second, um, what disturbs me even more than the false belief that things were substantially different a little while ago is the belief that that was a good thing, that, that if only we could have a time uh, again, it's argued, when, when kids obeyed without question and parents laid down the law. I mean, that's, I guess, excellent preparation for real life if you happen to live in a totalitarian society. Yeah. Um, 
But my own vision is that what we want ideally is for for kids to be um, happy, ethical, responsible, compassionate. And when I go around and speak to groups of parents and teachers, I begin by asking them, what are your long term goals for your children? And those are the kind of things that people say. Um, so what I do for a living, basically, is say to people, you say you want this. Why then are you doing that? And then I try to show based on logic and evidence that more traditionalist approaches to raising kids based on bribes and threats, even if we prefer to call them positive reinforcement right. and logical consequences, right. um, uh, do not meet our own goals for the kinds of people we hope children will grow into. Can you speak to what I hear a lot is that this idea that you're talking about where schools are more dangerous and teachers aren't respected and um, teachers are at risk. I know personally one of my good friends who's in her 70s now and was a principal in an elementary school and in the middle school says that in fact schools were much more violent when she worked in them when she was quite young. But that's one situation. Can you speak to that belief in terms of the science that you've read? Um, I don't know what the data say about actual danger to children in schools now versus at some point in the past. Um, I would point out the following, though. A um, hundred years ago, uh, far fewer kids went to school all the way through high school. So we have tried to provide democratic public education all the way through high school for a more uh, diverse and broader swath of, of young people today. Um, a lot of times when people harken back to the good old days, what they're really talking about is the time when um, lots of people were excluded, um, where things were more elite. The other thing I'd point out is the vast, I, ha I can look up the numbers, but the vast majority of violent crimes against children do not take place in schools. They take place in homes and on the street. Yes. So it would be wrong to blame schools for that. Um, I also point out that other um, charges against schools where our standards are falling and we don't demand excellence and mediocrity is acceptable and kids don't learn as well as they used to, um, that people were saying exactly the same thing in the 1950s. I begin with a quote from that. Um, and in fact, in the early 1900s. So just as with parenting, this sort of aggressive nostalgia turns out to be just another name for amnesia. <laughs> You know, one of the things, our audience for the No Spank Challenger parents, many of them have little children. And so, of course, this idea of spoiling, you know, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, and also the idea of permissiveness, can you, is, is something I think weighs on parents. Uh, can you explain the difference between neglect, which we know is very serious, and very damaging to children, and this idea of permissiveness um, and where you see that? Well, there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, colors on this continuum. It's not black and white, and it's it's not just that gray between black and white. Like, how do I find the right balance between punitive and permissive? Sometimes the alternative to black and white isn't gray; it's orange. You know, something off the continuum altogether. So there is a difference between neglect where you let kids do whatever the hell they want and uh, fend for themselves and a more deliberate and thoughtful policy of giving kids a lot more say over their own lives, even if it turns out to be more permissive than I personally would be comfortable with. There's still a difference between deliberate permissiveness and neglect. But I would argue for something that's not really permissive or punitive, but rather what I call a working with approach in which the parents are very definitely involved with children in trying to solve problems together. And I think what's so disturbing and limited and limiting about this notion of um, either you're permissive and neglectful or you're punitive is that if you don't like one of those options, you feel like you have no choice but to embrace the other. Yes. So it makes choosing easy. Yes. But, you know, and, and there are families where one parent is permissive and the other one is punitive based presumably on the assumption 
that two dysfunctional approaches magically cancel each other out. Right, um, uh, you know, there are even individual parents who swing back and forth between being one way and being the other. Uh, yes. One mom said, I'm permissive with my son until I can't stand him, at which point I become so punitive that I can't stand myself. Oh, my gosh. And, I, I, and I don't think we want either of those. No, right. What we want, and let me be clear about this, as perhaps you have been throughout this whole week of calling attention to spanking, the alternative to using physical violence on children is not to punish them and make them suffer in other ways, yes. such as forcible isolation of young children, which we euphemistically call time out, right. because a phrase like that sounds innocuous and makes us feel better about making kids feel bad. The problem isn't just with physical punishment, it's with anything that says, I'm going to make you better by making you unhappy deliberately. And isolating the kid or yelling at him is still about that same punitive approach, even if we don't lay a hand on him. Now, I take this to the next step, um, as you alluded to a moment ago, because just or almost as bad as punishment is reward, where we say to kids, do this and you'll get that, where we dangle goodies in front of them, yes. stickers or gold stars or ice cream or special treats and privileges. Rewards and punishments are not opposites. They're two sides of the same coin. And that coin can buy only one thing, which is temporary obedience, but at a terrific cost. So the alternative to a bribes and threat approach, a doing to model, is not permissiveness. It's what I call a working with model which is very difficult to specify in all its particulars because I can't give you a recipe. Right. Too much depends on the specifics of who this child is, what's going on with her, what the pattern has been, what the relationship is with the parent, and what our goals are. Yes, yes, it's interesting. If you can abandon the reward and punishment, the reward in particular, you can start thinking developmentally about what children need because a lot of uh, parents are dealing with little children and little children it's sometimes very hard to have conversations and use logic and, and all of that. You can do that at times but other times their cognitive capability is not present. And an right. interesting example of what you're talking about is when um, children have tantrums. I encourage parents to stay present with them, to not be afraid to get down on their level and touch them and soothe them and be with them and be sympathetic right. to them because of course if you're in a reward and punishment place the immediate worry is I'm going to reinforce the bad behavior by being affectionate to a child that actually doesn't have the cognitive capability or the neurological capacity to pull it together and that they really need us to co-regulate so it really is a big step the, the practical implication of these examples I agree with you are First of all, you can't solve the underlying problem at the time of the tantrum. Right. That's, that's clear. All you can do is help the child feel safe and loved and, if possible, get the child to a different place where he or she doesn't feel overwhelmed. Yeah. The last thing we want to do um, is to overwhelm the child with threats or coercion yeah. um, because the child is out of control um, anyway, um, needs support, um, needs someone who's saying, I love you no matter what. And how can I help? Um, not, you better stop this, young man, if you know it's good for you, or words to that effect. Or don't embarrass me in the grocery store, right? Right. And the don't embarrass me is key because uh, studies have confirmed what I think all of us know anyway, which is that when we're in public, we tend to become even more controlling, yes. which is the last thing that kids need. Yes. And uh, my hypothesis is that that's more true in a society like ours, yes. where there's generally critical judgment, even from strangers, for being insufficiently controlling yes. rather than for being too controlling. You'd have to set the kid on fire to get glares from strangers, right. you know? Yes. Um, yes. Most of the glares are for how come you're not making your kid silent so he's not a pain in the butt to me. Right. So we need to not worry about how people are going to view us. We need to worry what's good for the child. Yes, and as a society, it would be wonderful if we were more supportive of parents having a hard time with their children and not assume we know why, but just to love them and to be appreciative and right. smile and be kind. Right. On a theoretical 
level, what troubles me about this is uh, contained in the phrase you used a minute ago, which is the idea that we're afraid we're going to reinforce the child's bad behavior yes. if we're loving. And that you said a mouthful there. Yeah. Because here, I think we're getting at the core of what is just uh, so profoundly wrongheaded about most advice that's given to parents, even from people who say don't spank them. Because most of the people who say don't spank are telling you to control children in other ways. And the goal is still mindless obedience, and the method is still some form of manipulation, even if we've moved a step on this road beyond spanking. And this is based on a behaviorist model developed by people like the late B.F. Skinner that assume that when you do something nice for someone, uh, when you give them love or attention, for example, that this is going to be construed as reinforcement for a behavior. So when you're nice to kids, when they're doing when they're making trouble, they will view that as the equivalent of a reward for that behavior. And that's an assumption that we have to just unpack, as I tried to do in the early pages of the book I wrote a few years ago, you mentioned, called Unconditional Parenting. Um, The problem lies here with a model of psychology that was developed on laboratory animals and has been thoroughly repudiated by modern psychology, which is that we have to worry about giving kids attention and care lest it um, reinforce the bad stuff. So our job is to only reinforce the good stuff. The problem is with this whole way of looking at human interaction as as if we were training a, a pet. And the reality is that And again, it ties into this very negative view of children and humans um, that they will they will inevitably do the worst they can get away with unless they're tightly regulated and we give them a doggy biscuit for being nice. Um, When kids get unconditional love. When a kid is out of control and does stuff that pushes our buttons and makes us crazy, that's when kids need our attention and love the most. The last thing that kid needs is to be sent to his room or or, or, or deprived of dessert or for us to deliberately ignore children, which is horrendous in its implications. It's, it's like uh, shifting from thinking about bad behavior as dysregulated uh, brain activity, in essence, just not being able to self-regulate, and so they need us to co-regulate, they need us to help them, not by putting pressure on them, of course, but by being sympathetic and helping them cope. And to give them the message, I love you no matter what. Yes, I mean, yes. What kids need to know mm-hmm. that they don't have to earn our care. Because the kind of care that has to be earned isn't worthy of being called care at all. Kids need to get the message from us every day that we love them for who they are, not for what they do. And we will never dilute or diminish that care and attention and approval, um, even when they screw up or fall short. Yeah, it also is um, a preoccupation with their behavior and I often encourage parents whose children are not doing well and they can't seem to get connected to them to really spend time talking about how much they enjoy being with them. What is my experience of being with you? I love being with you. This is a this was my best part of the day so that the child really knows how much joy they bring me just because we're together so that there's an emphasis on the connection and our effect on each other. I, I Which wonder, is very different from when or if statements at oh, the end. I love totally being with different. you when you're well behaved. Right. Or, or we'll spend together time together tonight if you do your homework and get and the extra credit problem. Like using your relationship as a reward. 
Exactly. Oh, it's the most powerful form of manipulation. It's so destructive. I wanted to ask you um, if you could talk a little bit about, I know in our culture being independent is incredibly important to a lot of people. And so what I often see, particularly with little children, because they fluctuate in their function, you know, they're independent at one point and then they slip back and the parents are worried. Can you talk about how... Um, our preoccupation with fostering independence can interfere with children's developmental needs. We're so worried about parents being too close to their children that it seems like every other magazine article you read is about the dangers of the epidemic of over-parenting or helicopter parenting. Yeah. When the reality, and this is something I talk about in the new book, The Myth of the Spoiled Child, is that the far greater risk for children is that parents won't be supportive um, enough, um, won't be there. Now, I will acknowledge that there are some parents who need kids, their kids to need them. And so they may get too close and may do too much, but that's not because they're indulging kids. It's more because they're controlling them. And the, and the child's probably anxious about it. So It could be, yes. And, and what the kid is picking up on is not just the amount of closeness or lack of fostering um, independence, but the parents acting out of his or her own need. Uh, I need you to need me. Yes. Um, and, I, and I send you subtle signals that I'm not happy when you become independent. That is a problem. Right. But having said that, I think that if we are attentive to what children are telling us about what they need from us and what they don't, that we shouldn't worry so much about the idea that we'll be too close. Um, Underparenting is a greater concern. And I think part of this comes from our society's privileged position for the value of independence, that kids should learn to do stuff on their own as soon as possible and then do it. And we see this with toddlers. You're a big girl now. You can use a fork or I'm not going to pick you up. You can walk. And then if we see it again with, with teenagers and so on, where the idea is if the kid is 18 or the kid goes off to college, the parent should back the hell off and the kid is on her own. This is not a value that is shared universally. It is embraced more by men than by women, more by people in the Western world than in the Eastern world, more by middle class people than by working class people, more by whites than by people of color. And yet we tend to assume that it is a universal value uh, and there's something wrong if we're continuing to support kids. And uh, I think that's not necessarily true. We can support their autonomy, which is their sense of being able to fully own decisions that they make without necessarily pushing them to become independent. Those two aren't the same thing. Yes, that's really very nice. Yeah. Um, you know, I we have just a little time left. And one one of the common themes of parents who wanted to ask you questions uh, was, you know, many parents may themselves be kind of high strung or um, strong willed. And so they, for whatever reasons, I'm sure there's many, uh, they have a very strong willed child who you can't always reason with, who is very willful, who can be persistent beyond their control or bit of their own self control. And so I'm wondering, in your book, you talk about um, reflective rebelliousness, and I'm hearing it and I'm thinking about teenagers when you're talking about it, but I'm also thinking that okay, I'm a parent of a little child, and I want to encourage this uh, reflective rebelliousness, but at the same time, my son is such a handful, and, and he's so, um, he's not easygoing. How, can you just speak to that for parents, how to, you know, how to just sort of embrace that idea? Because right now, the rebellion is in the parent-child relationship. It's not out there fighting political, uh, ideological problems or... No, know. but if that's right. But if we want kids to be assertive, to be courageous, to question things that are um, disturbing, 
to be outraged by outrageous things when they're adults uh, instead of blindly becoming docile and doing whatever they're told by their peers when they're teenagers or by bosses uh, when it's just abusive. If we want them to be fully developed people who question, we have to begin by letting them and encouraging them to question us. Um, not by being obnoxious and rude and aggressive, um, but by but are, are not being defensive and getting huffy when they say, but why, or point out inconsistencies in what we've said. Yes. Um, uh, the problem here is not that the kid is too strong-willed, it's that the parent, on some level, is just more comfortable with mindless compliance. I don't think you want to raise a child who's a person later who's mindlessly compliant, so you can't start by valuing that here. And closely related to that is to begin by questioning the things we're demanding that kids do. Why can't I get my four-year-old to sit quietly through a long family dinner? Especially, how am I supposed to do that if I can't use rewards and punishments? Right. Well, the problem is with the demand, not with the kid who won't fulfill the demand. Yeah. It's just not developmentally appropriate. Some kids are louder um, and more difficult and require more patience. Yes. You know, And I know that with all kids, I'm a parent twice over, that sometimes you just want the kid to get in the damn car. <laughs> yes. you know, or, or out of the car or into the bath. Or you or want to finish a conversation and not have them constantly yanking on you. and Right. You know. That's right. Um, but sometimes when you attend to kids, um, they'll yank on you more when you put them off more. Yes. Because they need to know you're paying attention, and so you take time away and you say, "How can I help?" And then I have to I want to go back and talk to my friend for a while. What do you think? After I listen to you, you could do that will be fun for you by yourself for a few minutes, yes. giving the child as much choice as possible. Um, I think what's important for some parents uh, is that um, sometimes the child's just not developmentally there either. Like they really do need you to be with them. They really can't tolerate a whole bunch of friends coming over and a dinner party. They're just not that. Yeah. Maybe your friend's son can do it. And so it's hard to accept that my child actually is overstimulated by social uh, activities and really needs a lot of co-regulation, a lot of self-soothing with me. And it may be inconvenient, and that's true. It you know, and I, is. I like to tell parents if you, you know, if you want uh, a household that is uh, quiet uh, and 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 tidy all the time, maybe you should have had tropical fish instead of children. You know, <laughs> there, to some extent, you may just have to acknowledge that there will be sacrifices here, though that's easier to say when you're not in the middle of it and you haven't been able to finish a conversation or a nap or a shower, you know, in, yes. in the last, where well, you can't remember how much. Mm -hmm. But the point is that punishments and rewards to make kids give you that space not only won't solve the problem, but will strain and fray your relationship with the child and will make things worse in the long run. Mm -hmm. No reward or punishment ever helped children become better at self-regulating, become more caring and concerned about other people, or become more ethical, more responsible, or happier. All it does is harm. Moving past physical violence, like spanking, which teaches kids to hurt other people if they're stronger than they are, um, is the beginning of a process that continues by questioning all punishment and all reward. Not so we're permissive, just if I can sort of wrap all of this up now and come back to where we started. But in order to have a what I'm calling a working with relationship where when kids do stuff that disturbs us, it's not seen as an infraction to be punished. It's seen as a problem to be solved together. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn. Thanks for your work and for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks for your interest and in all you're doing. Yes. Bye-bye.